Uh, on the issue of testing, presiding officer, I must express frustration at the UK government's position. It is, of course, for the Prime Minister to decide how best to tackle COVID in England. However, current funding arrangements mean that while taxpayers in all four UK nations contribute to the costs, it is decisions taken for England that determine the resources available to Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland for testing and other COVID measures. As of now, we have no clarity on how much of the COVID testing infrastructure the UK Government intends to retain, no clarity on how much investment will support it in future, and no clarity on whether the Treasury will provide additional resources or demand instead that funding is taken from elsewhere in the health budget. I hope we do get this clarity soon so that we can then set out in more detail our own longer-term approach to testing. However, and I'll say more on this later, I want to give an assurance now that the Scottish Government is determined to retain a robust testing system capable of providing Scotland with strong resilience against future COVID threats and firmly aligned with public health advice and the principles underpinning our National Health Service. So in summary, we continue to face a very highly transmissible variant that is causing a high level of community infection. However, while it is far from harmless, its overall impact is less severe than Delta. So using the framework I described earlier, we assess the current threat level to be medium. However, assuming the level of infection and its associated impacts, for example, hospital admissions, falls or broadly stabilises, we would expect this to be reassessed as low in the period ahead. This has enabled Cabinet to agree this morning an indicative timescale for lifting or converting to guidance the small number of legally imposed protective measures that remain in place at this stage. So I can confirm firstly that the COVID certification scheme requiring certain venues and events to check the vaccine or test status of attendees will come to an end next Monday at the 28th of February. Uh, the app which supports the scheme will remain operational, however, so any business that wishes to continue COVID certification on a voluntary basis to reassure customers will be able to do so. Second, as of 21st March, assuming no significant adverse developments in the course of the virus, we expect that the legal requirement to wear face coverings in certain indoor settings and on public transport will be converted to guidance. We will continue to strongly recommend the wearing of face coverings in shops and other indoor public places and on public transport. We also expect on 21st March to lift the legal requirement for businesses, places of worship and service providers to have regard to guidance on COVID and to take practical measures set out in the guidance. And the legal requirement on businesses and service providers to retain customer contact details is also expected to end on 21st March. Presiding officers, governments obviously must act lawfully and that means we cannot impose legal restriction, restrictions when it is disproportionate to do so. As the situation improves and the severity of the impact from COVID reduces, we are therefore duty bound to remove legally imposed restrictions. But this should not be taken as a signal that COVID no longer presents any risk to health, because it clearly does. So even though certain measures, for example, face coverings, may not be legal requirements in future, we will still recommend voluntary compliance as part of the range of behaviours that will help keep us safe as we manage COVID in a more sustainable and less restrictive way. The strategic update we are publishing today sets out a clear framework for any decisions we may have to take in future in response to new developments. I want to stress this is intended as a contingency. We do hope, of course, that we never have to use it. However, it does recognise the ongoing challenge that COVID presents and sets out three broad levels of future potential threat, low, medium and high. It also offers illustrative examples of the type of protective measures that could be deployed in response to different threat levels. And it may be helpful to illustrate this through some general examples. If a new variant emerged that was more transmissible and more severe, perhaps with the ability to evade vaccine or natural immunity, this threat would likely be classified as high. In those circumstances, we might advise people to limit social contacts for a period and to work from home where possible, and we may introduce some temporary protections for high-risk settings. If a new variant, though, was either more transmissible or more severe, but not both, as is the case with Omicron, the initial threat assessment would likely be medium. 
In these circumstances, there may be a legal requirement to wear face coverings in some settings, and we might issue guidance for businesses and service providers on reasonable measures to reduce the spread of COVID on their premises. Lastly, in the absence of a new variant, or if a new variant was neither more transmissible nor more severe, and if vaccines continue to be effective, the threat classification would likely remain low. Obviously, this is the level we hope to reach and stay at on a sustainable basis. In these circumstances, there would be no legally imposed protective measures. Instead, we would continue to advise individuals and organisations to adopt sensible public health behaviours. It is important to stress that any decision about the threat level and what the appropriate response should be will be guided by data and evidence, but it is not an exact science. It will also, by necessity, involve judgment. That is because the kind of developments, developments we may face in future, principally uh, new variants, will not be uniform in their potential impact. A new variant that is highly transmissible but less severe would obviously require a different response to one that was less transmissible but more severe. So we must guard against a one-size-fits-all approach. That's why the framework doesn't propose fixed thresholds for action, for example, by stating that we will take certain predetermined steps if the number of cases rises above a specific level. Such thresholds may be superficially attractive because of the certainty they appear to provide, but they pose a very significant risk of both under- and overreaction.